that you teach us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're joining us uh, only this week, you missed out our last few weeks, then we're in a study in the book of Colossians, and we're in the fifth part of that study today. Uh, by way of uh, background, it's a letter written by Paul to the church at Colossae that was probably destroyed a year or a few years right after the letter reached them in an earthquake, never to be built again. Uh, Paul had never visited this church, never visited this city. He alludes to that in chapter 2 and verse 1. Uh, the church was most likely founded by a man called Epaphras, who was a product of Paul's ministry in Ephesus, which was just a few uh, miles away from Colossae. And Epaphras was a faithful uh, pastor or leader of the church and you'll see that in the book of Colossians as Paul refers to him a few times and his ministry among the church at Colossae. Today we're in chapter 2 and we're only looking at verse 6 and 7. Just two verses, verses 6 and 7. So allow me to read through those verses for us this morning as you follow along in your Bibles. And, and then we will look at it bit by bit. Really today we're really going to look at it bit by bit. It's just two verses but it is so profound. And my hope is this, that in understanding the depth of these verses and because we're looking at it word by word, that it will become something that we memorize in our heart and in our mind because it is a very, very, very beautiful verse to memorize and keep in the recesses of our heart and our mind. So look with me at Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Let me read that again. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in love. Okay, so let's get into it now. The first word in this little passage, two verses, the first word is the word therefore, which implies that Paul is about to call us to action. He's about to tell us something to do. He's going to call us to some kind of an action, but that is based on what he's been saying so far. The word therefore connects all that he said so far to the call to action that he's about to give us. So what has he been saying in chapter 1 of Colossians? Well, he's writing to them in the context of a heresy that surrounded them. There was a new teaching or a few different kinds of teachings that surrounded the church at Colossae. Uh, not yet in the church of Colossae because Paul would have used very different language if they had already given in to this heresy. But it's a letter of warning telling them to beware, to be strong in their faith. That's the context in which he writes. And in chapter 1, through all that he talks about, even you know when you, when you read through it, you can put all the content that you find there into three major themes or into three different buckets. You can put the information you find into those. The first is the power of the gospel of Jesus. The first theme that you find in chapter 1 is the power of the gospel of Jesus. Look with me at chapter 1 verse 5 onwards. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does amongst you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. And Paul talks about what this gospel is doing all across, the mystery of the gospel, Jesus being that mystery in the gospel. And as he, as he talks about this, you can put it all under this one theme or into this one bucket about the power of the gospel of Jesus, the power of that redemption story of Jesus, the good news of Jesus. The second bucket that you can uh, put information found in chapter 1 into is the theme of the person of Jesus. You see in verse 15 that Paul starts to talk about Jesus. He says, he is the image of the invisible God. And then he goes on to this amazing exhortation in Christology or in who Jesus is and what he has done. And we looked at that also a few weeks ago. The supremacy, the sufficiency, the sovereignty of Jesus. Just that amazing power and who Jesus is. And so you have the power of the gospel and you have the person of Jesus. 
And the last bucket that you see uh, in, in chapter 1 and the information that can be put in there is very personal because Paul talks about his own ministry on their behalf. But he alludes to Epaphras who had planted the church and in chapter 4 again he'll talk about Epaphras who, who wrestles for them in prayer, who struggles for them in prayer. And in, in many ways you can put all the information that Paul writes about his own labor for the church into the bucket or under the heading, the perseverance of the saints on behalf of the church, the perseverance of others on behalf of the church at Colossae, into which Paul would talk about all that he has done. And in chapter 2 he talks about, I want you to know how great a suffering I've endured for you, the struggle I've endured for you in the church at Laodicea. And so you have that, that, that third theme which talks about the perseverance of others on behalf of the church at Colossae. And based on these three buckets, he starts by saying, therefore, because of these three things, therefore, there's a call to action. Now, DBF Central, we have the same reasons at a far richer understanding of them today in 2018. The power of the gospel bearing fruit across the world. You know that it's true. At Paul's time, they thought the end of the world was Spain. And then later, somebody sailed across and realized there's America on the other side. They sailed the other direction and found Australia on the other side. And they realized the world was a lot bigger than what they thought. Today we have the complete map of the world. We know all the nations. And you know that the gospel is bearing fruit in all these lands. The power of the gospel, we know about its fruit-bearing ability. See, in Paul's time, Paul would have to write it down. Somebody would have to take the letter, go to the church, read it out at Colossae, and then they would know, oh, this gospel is bearing fruit in the world as well. Today, it's a Google search away. You just have to type, what does the church look like in China in Google? And you'd know, what does it look like in Africa, in any of the countries that make up the continent of Africa? And you would know, in Russia, in Ireland, in US, in South America, you would know in just a click of a button. So you are not devoid of the knowledge of the gospel, the power of the gospel and the fruit that it is bearing around the world. You have that bucket or that theme as well in your life. The person of Jesus has not changed over the years. Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. He has not diminished in his supremacy, his sufficiency or his, or his sovereignty. He's still the same. So that's not changed for you or for me. Just like it was for the church at Colossae. It is the same Jesus, the person of Jesus that we have today. And when you come to the perseverance of others on behalf of the church. <laughs> Man, we are so rich in the heritage that we have over the almost 2,000 years since Paul wrote these words. Because Paul writes about him and Epaphras at best who had endured for the church and all the struggles that they've endured for the church at Colossae. But you and I, we look back on church history from Paul who faithfully took the gospel beyond the boundaries of Judaism and the Jewish community into the Gentile world, into those who were non-Jewish people. He took the gospel out faithfully and he taught it to other faithful men who then taught it to other faithful men as well. From there the gospel spread through the perseverance of many men and women of God who took the word of God, the message of Jesus into the world that they knew at the time. In history, you have a William Tyndale who translated the Bible into English so that the common man could read it. He was martyred for it. They warned him, we'll kill you if you do it. And he did it anyway. And they killed him for it. But you and I have the Bible in a language we can understand because of men and women like him who spent hours translating the Bible into a language for the common man. You have people like John Wesley who went on horseback to, from village to village preaching the gospel. Sometimes seven villages a day preaching the message of Jesus so that the gospel went through Europe beginning from England. And as missions began to be a heartbeat over there, you had a William Carey who got up, took a boat, came all the way to India, settled in Calcutta and endured many, many kinds of sufferings for the sake of the gospel. But he persevered nonetheless, in spite of children dying, in spite of his wife losing her sanity, he persevered. 
for the sake of the gospel in India. Men and women after him who took that same passion for the sake of Jesus into towns and cities and villages of our great land over here. And that's just at that heritage of church history. And then you come to our 50th year, DBF, 50 years of existence. When long ago, Pastor Mare Kata opened his little house in Nizamuddin for a small Bible study. 50 years on, nine congregations, 26 services across the city of Delhi. In the logo for DBF Jubilee, you find the phrase, the tagline, it begins with, it established in faithfulness. And I was sitting at the table when we came up with the creator for that, the tagline. And the reasoning behind it was we are established in the faithfulness of God, but in the faithfulness of men and women who faithfully taught and preached the word of God in whatever context God allowed them to do so. Who discipled, who sacrificed, who gave. And so when you come to the the bucket of the perseverance of people on behalf of the church, you and I are richly blessed with the heritage that comes before us. Richly blessed with that heritage. The number of people who have persevered in the faith and for the sake of the gospel so that we can sit in an air-conditioned room with a Bible in our language celebrating the Savior. If they had reason to obey the therefore, my brother, my sister, we have greater reason to obey the therefore and what follows the therefore. Paul says, therefore, because of all of this, therefore, do something. And he's going to tell us the same thing today. Therefore, because you also know the power of the gospel. You also know the person of Jesus. You also know of those who have persevered on behalf of your own faith. Because of all this, therefore... And the next phrase you find, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Just as you received him, so walk in him, so continue in him. So you ask the question, how did they receive Christ Jesus, their Lord, the church at Colossae? Well, they received him by faith. See, it's in the context of a heresy that was around them that was saying, Jesus plus your works, Jesus plus worship of angels, Jesus plus observance of some rituals would get you salvation. And Paul is saying, listen, you received him by faith. You were helpless. You came to that point where you acknowledged nothing you do can bring you to life. You came to the point where you acknowledged your good works, as great as they look, are like filthy rags before God. You came to that point where you realized that you can obey, you can obey, you can do all as much obedience as you want. But Jesus wants faith. And faith is what pleases God. You came to him by faith. Just as you received him, that manner in which you came to Jesus, so continue to walk in him. So I ask you this morning to remember along with me. The day in your life when you came to faith in Jesus. That time when you came first face to face with Jesus. When you fell in love with him. When you were, your eyes were enlightened and open to the majesty of who he was. Do you remember that time in your life? The passion that you had for Jesus. The helplessness you felt without him. That that deep knowledge that you knew that you needed him and through him you can do everything and the moment you're outside him you just felt helpless and hopeless those days when you were so moved that you wanted to read the scripture and just devour it more and more of it you wanted anyone to teach you you wanted to serve in any way get involved in any way Jesus whatever you want me to do hey I'm here I want to do it but then we grew up we matured in our faith. And Paul says we want to present everyone mature in Christ. But here's the problem. See in the world when we talk about maturity. And a child growing up to maturity. We see independence as a sign of maturity. I've got three children. And as much as we wanted those three children. We still do. There will be a nice fun day when they'll finally leave. And the house will be quiet and clean. Finally. 
when they go to college and then hostel and then they start homes of their own. But we want them to grow in that direction because maturity is holding on to daddy and mommy's hand a little less tighter as the years go by. My daughter, my youngest daughter is two. She gets up in the morning and says, Daddy, I want milk. I get up and give it to her. But my middle daughter, who's, who's five, going to be six, if she gets up and says, Daddy, I want milk, I say, you know where it is? Go find it. You can reach it. You know the microwave. You know how you have to count one, two, three. You know how to count those numbers and you take it out because you grow. And as you mature, a sign of maturity is independence. But that doesn't translate into spirituality because Christian maturity is very different from the world's kind of maturity. Christian maturity is very different when you talk about spirituality. When it comes to Jesus and faith and Christian living, maturity, a, a, a mature Christian, as you grow deeper in Jesus, you realize there's more that you need to depend on God for. You realize how much more you need to depend on God. You realize how many other things in your life you need to bring to submit mission to Jesus and to give it to him it's not about as you grow maturer in Jesus you hold on to his hand a little less tighter it's not a sign of maturity in fact independence from God in a spiritual context is a sign of immaturity but oh we've become professional at our faith I don't need to pray so long before a decision anymore I, I, I know God what he's going to say. You know, I, I, I know what's going to happen. I know what breaks God's heart, so I don't have to ask him. I don't, uh, you know, prayer, word. I, little bit. I, I, you know, before I had to spend half an hour before I understood one verse. Now five minutes, that's all I know. I've become smart. I know how the Bible generally works. We mature in our faith and we slowly let go of the hand of God. But Christian maturity is about holding tighter and tighter onto God's hand in a world that drags morality and every other definition that God has into the dust. Just as you received him in that faith that just hung on to Jesus and said, it's you. Outside of you, I can't do anything. My dear brother, my dear sister, Jesus being God, son of God, as he walked on this earth in flesh incarnate, on this same planet that we live in, as he walked, he taught, and towards the end of his ministry, he was talking to his disciples and he said, I can't do anything by myself. Whatever the father tells me, whatever I see the father do, I do. If Jesus being God in that triune God, the son of God, if he depended on the father, where do we get that idea that maturity is about independence from him? That's about faith and dependence on God. But then you have our love for Jesus. See, I do premarital counseling with couples. And it's a, it's a lot of fun. So in case any of you are planning to get married, don't, don't get scared. It's a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun in premarital counseling. And the first session when we, we meet and talk, my wife and I will talk with them. And, and uh, one of the questions we ask them, because they're all like, you know, swoony and lovey-dovey and stuff like that. And so one of the questions we ask them is, what are some of the things, uh, what are the five or six top things you're looking forward to in marriage? You know, and they'll write all their answers. And the next question is a reality one, right? What are some of the things that you're scared about in marriage? What are some of the fears you have about marriage? And it's fantastic that most couples have this, this fear. A loss of intimacy over time. Where we began in love with each other and we're so, you know, I can't do anything without this person next to me. But, uh, you know, I, I just want to hold his hand and I just want to hold her hand. And, you know, with them by my side, I just feel stronger, that feeling. And then five years, ten years, your flatmates suddenly. You get up in the morning, you go your different ways. You love each other, there's no doubt about it. But you go your different ways. You live different lives. Catch up again in the evening over dinner. The day went well. No issues. Go to bed. Most young couples who are getting married have that fear. That over time, with familiarity, 
we lose intimacy. I remember when I got married in 2009, a few, uh, a little while after that, when DBF was celebrating its 40th year uh, of, of existence, Pastor Reed, who was a pastor of DBF Central a long time ago, Pastor Robert Reed and his wife, Ruth, had come here. And I remember they attended service and everybody was pressing on them for their time because they all wanted to meet him. He was standing right outside the upstairs balcony door, right outside on the stairs landing. And I went up to him and he knows me from when I was a little kid. And, and he, when he was a pastor here, I was part of the worship team back in 95, 96. I used to start, sing with him on stage. And so he came up to me and he saw me through some weird times of, of my youthfulness. And so he said, you got married. I think he might have had a fear. He said, you got married, congrats, well done. And everybody was looking at, looking uh, for time with him. And so I very quickly, I said, Pastor, quickly, everybody wants to talk to you. What one piece of advice can you give me? Very quickly, as a pastor, so many years of being married and a pastor. What Quickly, one nugget of advice that you would give me. And he didn't even bat an eyelid. It was there on the tip of his tongue, which means he lives by it. He stood outside this door. He took my hand with both his hands and he held it and he said, don't let the honeymoon die. Brilliant piece of advice for any young couple, any old couple. Don't let the honeymoon die. But this is not a sermon about marriage. I submit to you that our honeymoon with God, we let die very often. See, you began deeply in love with Jesus because you saw the hopelessness of yourself without him. Deeply in love with him. Absolutely passionate about him and everything to do with him. But over time, other things have waned your passion for him. The church at Ephesus was a good church, a great church. When Paul writes to them, there's no problem that he puts his finger on. He just exhorts them to be even better because they're a great church. They had a great pastor. They didn't have reverend as a title at the time. So, you know, they probably just called him pastor. But he was Pastor Timothy who was probably Paul's closest disciple. The one that Paul called Timothy, my son. The last letter that Paul ever wrote was to Timothy. Timothy was the pastor of the church at Ephesus. And the Ephesian church was a great church, an exemplary church. But in Revelation chapter 2, you find that God talking to the church at Ephesus says to you, the church at Ephesus, I know your works, great works. You do amazing things. You even hate the practices of those who, who do things against my heart. You hate the sin that you see around you. Great. But I have one thing against you. You lost your first love. All the events, all the giving, all the evangelistic crusades, all the things you do, all the condemning of sin around you. Wonderful, great. I know all that you do. But in the midst of all that activity, you have lost your first love. He doesn't tell them what their first love is. Maybe their first love became ministry. It's a danger. Maybe their first love became themselves and their image in the world outside. I don't know what it is. But Paul, uh, but uh, God writing through John, he speaks to the church at Ephesus and says, you have lost your first love. And the verdict for it is damning. Because God says, if you don't rectify then I will come to you and I will take away the lamp of my witness from amongst you. DBF Central, as a community and as individuals, is God still our first love? Look back to the day you first came to Jesus. Has familiarity and that walk with him been deterring to your love for him? Then you're walking incorrectly if familiarity with Jesus has caused you to love him less and less passionately then something has gone wrong therefore as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord so walk in him just as you received him walk in him with that, that deep faith and that passionate love for him verse 7 rooted and built up in him and then he says established in the faith. And he's not using two synonyms, rooted and established. That's not what he's doing. They're two different meanings for this word. He's using a different picture when he uses the word rooted. Because he says rooted and built up in him. So the rooted goes with the being built up. What does that mean? Well, he's saying let your roots be in Jesus. Let you 
live a life where you're drawing your nourishment from Jesus. All that you need for life and godliness. All about your identity. All about your character. All about your, your need for love. Your need for acceptance. Your need for whatever else you need. Draw it all from Jesus. Because otherwise you'll draw it from others around you. And others around you let you down. Draw it all from Jesus. Draw your nourishment from Jesus. And as you draw your nourishment from him, you will be built up in him. Now what that picture does is it gives you this picture of Christian living that is dynamic and fresh and growing. So I want to ask you a question again, DBF Central. Have you become stagnant in your walk with God? So when you go and buy vegetables, right? I don't know how many of you do. But if you have ever bought vegetables in your life, you'd notice this, this, this little thing that happens. You go, you can buy whatever vegetable you want, right? Potato, onion, tomato, or, you know, more exotic ones like lemongrass and stuff like that. Right? Whatever you want to buy. You pay the bill, and as you're paying the bill, you'll also notice they'll put a packet of dhania mirchi. It's just always there. It's, the, it's, the, it's like a condiment that comes with a burger. Right? You get a packet of dhania and mirchi that you get. If you don't know what I'm talking about, coriander and green chilies. Right? Just in case. Dhania mirchi that you get in a little packet. And as you take out the dhania from the packet, you find that it has roots. It's got its roots, right? You look at it next time you buy. See, now the next time you see dhania, you're going to think Jesus. I love this. You're such holy people. But you take out the dhania, it's got roots. It has the roots. But the problem is, it's not rooted to anything. It's not drawing its nutrient from anything at all. It is dead in that moment. It's over. Maybe that's your faith. Some time ago at some camp, at some meeting, somewhere you raised your hand, you, you broke down in tears, you came face to face with Jesus and the beauty of what he's done for you and you sprouted those roots at that time. But over time, with familiarity, with busyness, with all sorts of other ideologies, with all the hurts and, and disappointments you might have had, with the successes that might have distracted you, all of life that happened after that, that, that root that you sprouted didn't go anywhere after some time. You're like that, that plant lying on a kitchen table counter top. It's got roots. But it's drawing nothing. And it's dead. And Paul, say, uh, Paul writes to the church at Colos Colossae and says, be rooted in him. Have your roots in Jesus. As you're rooted in him, those roots will grow deeper and deeper and as they draw those nutrients from Jesus all that you need for life and godliness you will be built up in him as well you cannot be built up unless you are rooted in him you won't see a plant grow magically when the roots are going nowhere be rooted and built up in him and Jesus says it as well in John when he talks to the disciples in the upper room. Abide in me. For outside of me you can do nothing. But if you abide in me you will bear much fruit. Be rooted and built up in him. And established in the faith. As you were taught. And here's where he talks about being firm and grounded. Being established in the faith. Again in the context of a heresy that was telling them. Listen Jesus plus good works. Jesus plus rituals. Jesus plus worship of angels. Jesus plus this gives you salvation. Paul says no listen. You remain steadfast in the faith that you were taught. That Jesus is sufficient. You remain there. You be established in that faith. Don't move to the left or to the right. You build on that foundation of faith. Because the foundation around them that was being taught was faith plus something. Paul says, no, you, you've heard that it's just faith. Faith is what it takes to please God. Real, authentic faith. That faith will produce a lifestyle. It will produce works. It will produce love. But faith, faith is what you have. Be established in that faith. And the last phrase that he goes to, he says, abounding 
in thanksgiving. I love that he didn't just end with, you know, established in the faith just as you were taught with thankfulness. He says abounding in thanksgiving. So I, I typed out the word abounding in Microsoft Word and I clicked on the thesaurus and I looked at synonyms for the word abounding. Plentiful, wealthy, rich, overflowing, abundance of. That's what it's talking about. So it's not that, you know, every now and then God does something and you're so happy and you're, you come to church, you sing a little louder on that Sunday because I'm, I'm thankful. No, Paul is saying your life has to have an overflow of thanksgiving from it. See, it's not based on what's going on in your life because Paul would argue with you to say, before you were born, you were already severely in debt to God for what all he has done for you. Before you were born. The, the extent to which he has loved you, the forgiveness you find in Jesus, all that he has already done on your behalf, the victory that he won for you, that you would never be able to win on your own. That victory that he won over sin and death for you, the eternity that he has guaranteed to you in Jesus, all of that before you were born, you already were in severe debt to God. You owe him your gratitude, your praise, your worship. And so Paul, and, and keep in mind, Paul is writing from a prison. This letter is from a prison. And yet in every chapter of Colossians, you'll find either the word rejoicing or thanksgiving or thankfulness. That attitude, that motif of being grateful. In every chapter of Colossians written from a prison cell. Because Paul says it is possible to live a life that is abounding with gratitude. But it happens when you fix your eyes on Jesus and you know all that he has done. Just as you received him, that faith and that passion and that love for him, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in that faith that you were taught and abounding with thanksgiving or in thanksgiving. When do we not do this? I'll tell you. When we forget the therefore. When we forget the power of the gospel of Jesus. When we forget the perseverance of others and the rich heritage that we have to stand on. And when we forget the person of Jesus. When we diminish it. When Jesus becomes the blurry background and something else or someone else becomes the in focus foreground. That's when walking as we received him, becomes something that we don't know. That's when the roots don't go anywhere and life as a Christian becomes stagnant. Yeah, God's mercies are fresh every morning, but my walk, I have to think back a few years before I can tell you what God has done in my life. The roots are going nowhere. The faith is a bit wavering. Because current culture and trends and truths and beliefs around us seem to rock us from beneath our feet. And thanksgiving is a thing of the past. We have little reason to thank God for in our life today. Because maybe there's just one too many and unanswered prayer. We have forgotten the therefore. And we have diminished who Jesus is. And we are no longer walking as we first received him. So DBF Central, if that's you today, I want to call you to either refocus if you've been looking somewhere else spiritually or to repent if you've gone wrong. Together, this, this message has been burning in my heart all week about myself. I couldn't sleep. I woke up at four in the morning and I was on my knees. Telling God, start with me. If I've got to refocus, if I've got to repent, start with me, God. And I've been praying for you. And the worship team is about to come and sing a song that they've been praying for three weeks over to lead you to that powerful place of refocusing, reconnecting and repenting before God. And I want to urge you to use this time to come clean with God. 
to say, God, here I am. Maybe I've diminished my view of Jesus. Maybe I'm looking somewhere else altogether. God, I want to remember how I loved you. I want to remember how I needed you. I want to remember that deep intimacy I had with you. I want to remember and I want to live it all over again. I don't want a stagnant Christian life anymore. I want a fresh, real, current one. But every day, God, I'm growing new in you. Use this time to get right with God and then we'll pray.